opportunity to be able to uh, be with you tonight. I've enjoyed the time that we've been able to uh, spend together this day and to be able to gather together and worship and to study the Word of God and to even share a meal together. I've been enjoying uh, the time that we've had so far. And I hope they have another, uh, look forward to the other, another opportunity to be able to study from the Word of God together this evening. So if you have the Heavenly Library with you, if you'd open to Deuteronomy chapter 6 with me, and we'll begin our study there uh, this evening. I'm sure that you're familiar with the discussion of Jesus in the 22nd chapter of the book of Matthew, uh, where Jesus is asked by the lawyer, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus gives what I'm sure we're all familiar with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself is the second one. And if you study the Bible very much, I think it becomes quickly obvious that if you see in the New Testament a quotation in the Old Testament, there's generally some kind of understanding by the author that you have an understanding of the context in which this statement is written. And so Jesus in Matthew chapter 22 is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and look at this quotation, I think we get a better picture of what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so I want to spend a few moments looking at that this evening and what we might learn about loving the Lord your God and how we might, if we can, improve and love the Lord with more of our hearts in the life that we live. The book of Deuteronomy is... Of the second law, second telling of the law, duo or two is kind of the, the idea there. And then law, second law is the, the, the idea of Deuteronomy. Chapter 5, we find the Ten Commandments being relisted. Uh, Moses reminds them. And in fact, uh, the book of Deuteronomy kind of sort of serves as a farewell address for Moses as he's about to die and he's about to uh, pass the leadership off to Joshua. And he reminds the Israelites of these things and tells them, uh, you're about to enter the promised land, and this is what's going to happen. You're going to be faithful to the Lord, and when He does, when you do, then God's going to bless you, and He's going to uh, protect you. And He even goes so far to say you're not even going to suffer miscarriage. That's how blessed they would be. But when you don't, uh, there's going to come a time where you're going to rebel against the Lord. And when you do, this is what's going to happen. And so uh, we find Moses kind of preparing the Israelites and saying, this is what you need to do when you get there. And we know how the story goes. Uh, but I want to read the first few verses of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we'll uh, jump into looking at uh, this, this verse here. Now, this is the commandment, verse 1, the statutes and the judgments with the, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your sons and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all the statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O oh, Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, so that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O oh, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your head, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house, and on your gate. And then he continues on with some other warning. But we'll stop there, and I think that's the, uh, the, the text that we're going to look at this evening. He begins in verses 4 and 5 with the, the heart of what we're familiar with. And that's what Jesus quotes from in Matthew 22. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, there's a bit of discussion here as to what exactly Jesus is or how exactly that best ought to be translated. But I think the bottom line that Moses is pointing out here in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 is that God is to be the sole object of Israel's worship, of their allegiance, and of their affection. They are to honor the Lord and to the Lord alone. And this points back, in fact, to the previous chapter. Now, when Moses gives them the Ten Commandments once again, where he says in, in verse, I believe it's verse 
7, you shall have no other gods before me. And then the second one, you shall not make for yourself an idol in any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. And you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And so once again, and, and it kind of seems like God shouldn't have to keep reminding the people, but he does, that he's the only God. And, and they should serve him by alone, and, and they should forsake all these other gods to claim sole allegiance to the Lord. But as we know the history of Israel, they don't really get the picture. And so Moses reminds them again, God is not one God among many gods. He is the God, the only God, and the one true God of heaven. And if Israel is to be blessed, and if Israel is going to please this God, they have to serve him, and they have to serve him alone. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. But remind, Moses, as he reminds them of the Ten Commandments here, he reminds them of all that God had done for them. If you read the first five or six verses of Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses says, remember you were slaves in Egypt. The Lord our God made a covenant with you at Horeb. He did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are alive today. And he describes the fact that you were, you were in, in Egypt and, and that you've God has blessed you, He's delivered you, and He's brought you safely through the, the Red Sea, and He made this covenant with you. And I think the point there is Moses shouldn't have to remind them of all that God had done for them. Because even as Israel is about to enter into the Promised Land, they've witnessed the power of God. Many of these folks, and I guess some were maybe a little younger, but many of these folks might have even remembered the time in Egypt when they were delivered, when they saw the nation of Egypt crippled by the ten plagues. And then they, are they leave the land of Egypt and come to the Red Sea, and they witness Moses standing in the water, and it parts, and they walk through on dry ground. And if that wasn't magnificent enough, they come to, the Mount, to Mount Sinai, where they see the presence of God descending upon the mountain, and they hear the thunderings and the lightnings, and they hear with their own ears the very voice of God Himself. And if that's not enough, day by day by day, they want this bread falling from heaven to feed them, and the quail that they had to eat. And so Israel's witnessed with their very eyes the power of God, and they have no excuse not to acknowledge Him. And I know we kind of read through some of these passages and. Think about what Israel did as they throughout their history. We kind of scratch our heads and think, how'd they not get it? And yet, we're just like them. And we struggle ourselves. So, God said, or Moses says in verse 4, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Israel is called to respond to all that God has done for them, the blessings that they've received, the love that he's shown them. He's called, they're called upon to show that same fullness of love that God has displayed toward them. And so throughout this context, what Moses is doing is telling Israel that they need to be careful to observe the laws that God has given them. If you remember verse 3, listen and be careful to do it. Now, I want to point out this obedience that they're being called to, to observe here. It's not some kind of wooden adherence to the law or some kind of barren legalism. And that's what a lot of the Pharisees tended to do in the times of Jesus. They were just doing the law without really giving consideration to what this, these things are supposed to mean. Because when God gives instructions, it's always meant to teach us something. We'll talk a little bit more about that on Thursday. But God is not telling them to do these things simply for adherence sake. He's not telling them, I want you to do this just because I want to see how dedicated you are. And there's a reason behind these things. And God wants the, the obedience to these commands then is not to be done out of necessity. I guess I have to do this, but rather they need to be done out of a expression of love for God. And so, I think this indicates that even in the Old Testament, God is concerned with the heart of man. And if you've ever heard before, 
And some people tend to say that the God of the Old Testament was some kind of cruel taskmaster type fella. And then we get to the New Testament and he's some kind of cuddly old teddy bear. Well, let me tell you something. In the Old Testament, it's the same exact God that we read about in the New Testament. And so when God tells us in, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, or verse 5, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's the same God that we read about in the New Testament. God doesn't change. And so when we read this here in Deuteronomy, we can learn something from it. Something that Israel is supposed to learn from it. And hopefully we can be better off in our service to the Lord. So love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The heart, according to the Hebrews, uh, was regarded as the seat of the mind or the will. And I think we all know that when the Bible talks about the heart, it's not talking about the pump that sends blood throughout your body, but rather it's your mind, it's your intellect, it's your will, your desires. And they're saying that's the way the Hebrews viewed it. So when we talk about loving the Lord with all of our heart, I think heart is generally where we think about the idea of affection residing. But the point is we need to love God with all of our being, all of our will. And then he talks about the soul, and that kind of is a little more difficult to translate or to figure out what it is that it's referring to, but it seems to be the source of life and vitality or even one's own being. So you love him with really all of your heart or your mind, and then you love him with all of your being. And when we place those two terms together, it indicates that what God desires for his people is that they serve him with unreserved devotion. He's not looking for people who half-heartedly serve him. He's not looking for people who are going to go through the motions and do things just for the sake of doing it. But he's looking for people who are completely devoted to him and their service is an expression of the very love that they have in their hearts. And then the third expression given, with all of your might or with all your strength, we ought to serve God with all that we have. With everything that we have to offer. To the very best of our ability. And I want to point out that these verses here, 4 and 5, they're surrounded by a discussion of carefully observing the law of God and keeping it. And so what you might see is a sort of chiastic structure here where verses 4 and 5 are in the middle of this discussion of loving God and, and keeping His commandments and observing His statutes and remembering His law. And then it all points there in the middle to emphasize love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so when the Lord is loved, when we love Him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and all of our might, His Word, then, will be treasured. It's going to be thought of often. It's going to be talked about. It's going to be written. And it's going to be lived in the life that we live. I think if you go to the first psalm, I think that this blessed man or this righteous man that is described in the first psalm is really the, the epitome of what we're talking about in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. He says in verse 1 of Psalm, chapter, or Psalm 1, in verse 1 it begins with the blessed man is one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his word he meditates day and night. And he can goes on to describe that this man's going to be firmly rooted or established. He's like a tree that's, that's rooted into the ground and it yields its fruit when it's supposed to and its leaf does not wither and he prospers in whatever he's supposed to do. That's the blessed man that's going to be described here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so, the all-encompassing love for God, loving God with your heart, with your soul, and with your might, is to find its expression in a willful and joyful obedience of the commandments of God. And that theme, I think, is developed in the first three verses and in the final four verses. 
And so I want to look at those other verses surrounding verse here for just a few minutes for the rest of our time and see what loving the Lord your God practically is going to look like in our lives. Again, it's not going to be some wooden adherence where I'm just, all I'm doing is thinking about what the law says and I'm not really concerned about what God's trying to show me through it. It's like the guy who, you know, he, he, he just going to, 25 miles an hour, and I'm not going to, if I, I'm not going to allow it to go even a little bit faster than that, I'm just going to, 25 miles an hour? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying you need to go to speed, and that's not my point. But sometimes we treat our laws today, or we treat the laws of God like we treat our laws today. I don't really like it. I, I guess that's what I have to do. And yet, when we approach the law of God that way, it's an indication that we don't love the Lord with all our hearts. So, in verse 1, he says that we, uh, they're going over to the land and they ought to keep the commandments which the Lord has given. In verse 2, he says that you, so that your son, your grandson, might fear the Lord your God to keep all the statutes. So when I love God, first of all, that means I'm going to fear God. Now obviously there's a couple ways in which that word is used. Fear can mean the idea of being afraid where we're absolutely terrified. And I certainly think there's an appropriate occasion for that kind of thing. Uh, but it's also the idea of reverence or the idea of a respect, a healthy respect for something. And I think there's a little bit of case where both of those are important when we in regard to considering God. The fear of God is acknowledging the power of God. We're acknowledging His greatness, His sovereignty, but we're also recognizing His judgment. I think there are several verses in which that idea is expressed. Matthew 20, 10 and verse 28, where Jesus says, Don't fear the one who can destroy the body but cannot destroy the soul, but you fear Him who can destroy both soul and body in hell fire. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, when he talks about the, the, the man who has sinned willfully, he says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. And so when we come to fear God, we need to realize his power and the fact that we're going to be judged by him. And that's a fearful thing if you're not loving him with all your heart. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, he says there in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. But this fear ought to be tempered by our love and our respect for God. And there's many passages that I think would indicate that. We could go on and on and on and on looking at verses that describe the fact that we need to fear God. There's just a couple of them. Psalm 89 and verse 7 says, God is greatly to be feared in the counsel of the Holy Ones and awesome above all those who are around him. And in Proverbs 1, in Proverbs 1 and in verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, wisdom, of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So when we love God, or when we fear God, it's going to be tempered by the fact that we love Him. And we respect Him all and the power that he possesses. And he's going, we're going to show that proper fear and reverence toward him. In Hebrews 12 and verse 28, the context there describes the fact that we're receiving a kingdom. And he begins in that section by describing the fact that we're not going to Mount Sinai like Israel did. You know, they were there present at the foot of the mountain, and they see the, 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 the clouds descending, they see the thunder and the lightning, and they, or they hear... They hear the thunder, they see the lightning, and they hear the very voice of God. He says, we're not going to that mountain, we're going to Mount Zion. And he says in verse 28, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, reverence and fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So yes, we ought to love God. And there's a lot of folks that say, well, I don't fear God, I love Him. The Bible says we need to fear God. And I love the Lord with all my heart, and I hold fast to His Word, and I truly understand the nature of God. 
there better be a fear of God in our hearts. But it also says in verses 2 and 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 6 that I'm going to be careful to obey the law. In verse 2, he tells them to command the, to, this is the commandment of the statutes, the judgments which the Lord has commanded me to teach you. In verse 2, so that you and your sons and your grandsons might fear the Lord to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. He says, oh Israel, you should listen. You should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly. And that's not very popular today because people don't want to hear that they need to be obedient to anybody, but that's what God has said. And when we love the Lord with all our heart, we're going to be careful to keep His Word and to do what God's Word has said. To make sure that we are living in alignment with the Word of God. And this means that I'm going to take care that I walk in a manner that God expects me to walk. Because if I'm going to be judged according to the Word of God, I need to make sure that I'm living according to the Word of God. And I think if we look there at the end of, at the middle of verse 3, we get a picture of why God wants us to be careful to observe His statutes. Again, it's not that God is just giving us some kind of busy work, or He's not testing us to see how how devoted we are to him. He's giving us these laws because it's for our own good. There in verse 3, he says that it may be well with you. This is for our benefit. The laws that God has given us are to help us. And too often they keep us out of trouble. You remember in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, children are told to obey their parents in the Lord for this is right. It says that it may be well with you. And that you may live long on the earth. Uh, in some ways, I've thought that part of that is because they won't kill you when you do. But the point is, your parents are going to teach you things that are for your own benefit. That's why they tell you, don't go playing out in the middle of the street. That's why parents don't allow their kids to make the dinner choices because they just want to have candy for dinner every night, right? And that mean old parent making that child eat their vegetables because it's good for you. You know, it, the parents are giving them these, the kid, these instructions to help them. And God is no different. God is the same. And so when we look at the, the laws that God has given us, they're important, not just because God said it, but it's, got to, it's going to help us. When you go through the Bible and look at the different things that God has told us to do and the, and the manner in which He has called us to live, it's just better, isn't it? When you look at the world and, and all the problems that the people of the world have to experience, it's a result of sin. When you look at marriage and the thing that God has, has planned and purposed for marriage, and when you see when people do God's way, it works. And when people give themselves in all sorts of messes, it's because they're doing it their own way. And you can go on and on and on with different areas of life where people do things their own way and it doesn't work. And if they just do it God's way, it'd be so much better. And so if I love the Lord my God with all my heart and soul and might, I'm going to be careful to keep His Word. And I'm going to recognize the value of it. But also, as he says in verse 6, I'm going to keep it in my heart. He says, you sh these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. This is the key, I think, to loving the Lord our God with all our hearts. The Word of God, then, is not going to become some burdensome law. And I guess to illustrate that a little bit, if the, method, the government, in their infinite wisdom, decided that uh, we're going to make every single speed limit 25 miles an hour. It doesn't matter if it's an interstate that's expanding the country. Regardless, you're not allowed to drive over 25 miles an hour. If I'm driving cross country, that's going to be a burdensome law, right? And I'm going to be miserable the entire time I'm just putt putting across the, end of the country. And too many people approach the word of God that way. They approach it as if it's some burden, as if it's some kind of weight that they have to carry. 
But when we love the Lord our God with all our hearts, the Word of God is not burdensome. The commandments that He's given us are not heavy weights that we're given. They're our delight. In Psalm 119, and of course I know you all have studied the Psalms before, and the 119th Psalm is all about the Word of God. He said at the beginning of verse 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Establish your words to your servant and as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. That's the kind of thing that someone who loves the Lord with all their heart is going to say regarding the Word of God. When you look at the nation of Israel and how they're just the opposite. I think it's the book of Malachi where they say regarding the worship of God, oh, what a weariness. I think it should be obvious to us that obviously Israel doesn't love the Lord with all their hearts in many kind of cases. But you see the Psalms, many of them written by David, and David described as a man after God's own heart. And then you read through the Psalms and you see how he treats the Word of God. And then you think, no wonder. No wonder David is known after a man after God's own heart. Because very clearly he loves God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his mind. And so the Word of God is going to be precious to us. Number one, because it comes from God. It comes from the one that we love with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Number two, we're going to realize the value of it. We're going to realize how important it is and how much good it can accomplish in our lives and in the lives of those around us. But also the fact that it has the power to save my soul. Romans 1.16, the gospel of the power of God unto salvation. He says in James chapter 1 and verse 21 that we ought to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. But there's an important thing there. The word of God is able to save your soul, but it says the implanted word. This book, the words of this book have the power to save our soul, but it's going to do no good sitting on our shelves. It has to be implanted within our hearts. At some point, at some point, the Word of God has to go from being, the words of God have to go from being highlighted in our Bibles to being written on our hearts. It's fine that we want to highlight these verses or we want to post on Facebook these verses that, that are meaningful to us, but at some point that has to be written within our hearts because that's what's going to transform our lives. And we can have all these verses that are highlighted, but if we don't carry them in our hearts, it's going to mean nothing. And so if I love the Lord with all my heart, His Word is going to be on my His Word is going to be in my heart. And then also in, in verses 6, 7, and 8, and He says that He's going to teach them to your children. A few years ago, I had taught the book of Exodus, and one thing that impresses me is when you get to the end of the ten plagues, as God is leading Israel out of Egypt, and he's starting to tell them the law, over and over and over and over again, God tells them, tell these things to your children. Remind them. When you observe the Passover and your children ask you, why are we doing this? Tell them that I delivered you out of Egypt. Because the greatest gift that a parent can give their child is the knowledge of God and teaching them to know God and to develop a heart that loves Him with all of their heart. It's the greatest gift a, child, a parent can give their child. And God realized the importance of that, which is why He says it over and over again. Tell your children. And as we continue on through the history of Israel and you see 
as Israel goes into the promised land and they start to develop themselves as a nation. In the book of Judges, chapter 2 and verse 10, we find it recorded that Israel had failed to do that. Israel failed to teach their children the laws of God and, and they failed to remind them of the blessings that God had done. And it says in Judges 2 and verse 10, there arose a generation that did not know the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. That's a sad commentary on the nation of Israel. But there's people all around us that don't know the Lord or the works that he has accomplished for us. Sadly, there's a lot of Christians that don't know the Lord and the work that he's done for us. And so, when Israel failed to teach their children, what's the result? The constant cycle of idolatry and sin. It's the fourth cycle, not found on road dead. But they forsook God, and so they were oppressed by some kind of tribe or nation. They repented, and God appointed a deliverer or a judge uh, to deliver them from their oppression. And that's the constant cycle. Why? Because they didn't know God or His commandments or His law or what He had done for them. And because they didn't know God, they couldn't love Him with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind. Because the parents have failed in their job to instill these things in their children. And so first and foremost, that's going to be accomplished by the parent living by their faith. And I want to talk a little bit more about living by faith on, on Friday. Uh, but they demonstrate their faith to their children in the life that they live. Verse 7, teach them diligently to your sons and Talk, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. It's not just saying, I need to check my box and, okay, I'm sitting down, I need to talk about the Word of God. Or I'm rising up, I need to talk about the Word of God. Or I'm walking by the way, I need to tell my son about the Word of God. But the point is, is it's going to always be on your mind because that's, that's what controls you. That consumes your mind and it consumes your life. And you're going to talk about that. You know, the things that we love, we talk a lot about. We can talk hours and hours and hours about our hobbies. Or we can talk hours and hours and hours about sports or, or things that are important to us. How much time can we spend talking about the Word of God? Parents need to teach their children and live by their faith so their parents can see that godly example. And then he goes on to say they need to teach the commandments to the children and help them to develop that heart that loves God with all of their being. And so, as we conclude this section, Moses comes to verses 8 and 9. And this is kind of an interesting section. He says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. Now, I'm sure when y'all were studying through the, the, was it the Sermon on the Mount last year, maybe the year before, fairly recently, I'm sure y'all noticed as you go through some of the, specifically the fifth chapter, how the Pharisees tended to literalize everything, right? And so God says, don't murder, and they say, well, I'm going to, you know, basically, and this might not be exactly the way they thought, but I can beat this guy within an inch of his life, but I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him. And I hate his guts, but I didn't kill him. And God says, you don't understand. You don't understand. And so the Pharisees tended to literalize everything. And so what they would do is have leather straps on their hands and they would have these phylacteries, these boxes with scriptures on it. And then Jesus says in Matthew 23, you brought in your phylactery, basically showing off. Look how much scripture I've got on my forehead. And they had scripture boxes on their doorposts. And I heard of somebody who was helping somebody remodel a house. And there was this little box and it was a, a scripture box that someone had put there. 
and say, well, I'm not going to remove the Word of God. Which I think is an appropriate attitude to have. But the point is not that we're to literally carry the Scriptures bound on our hands or on our foreheads. So that's never a bad idea to carry the Word of God with you. If you want to carry your Bible with you, that's a wonderful thing to do. The point is not literally to bind it on your hand. What's the point then? When the Bible speaks of our hands, often it's referring to what we're doing, right? Whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might. And so when he talks about binding it on your hands, let God's word rule over all that you do. <clears throat> Everything you do is going to be governed by the word of God. When he talks about it being as frontals before your eyes, it's the idea of keeping it ever present before you. It's always going to be on your mind. Is that it's if it's right there in front of your eyes and you can't, it's, you go to the eye doctor and they bring that little thing down in front of you and they ask you to read it and determine what, whether you can have 20 20 vision or not. And then you can kind of carry it around you everywhere you go. The Word of God needs to be in our hearts at a point where it's almost as if it's right there in front of us. Have you ever heard somebody be described as kind of a walking Bible? It's in their mind. It's in their hearts. And then the doorposts and the gates show that God's word is going to be present in your home. It's going to govern your home and all that you do. And I think a lot, there's a lot of places where you can buy these, these things to put scriptures up in your home. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing that people want to hang God's word upon their, their, their homes, the walls of their homes. But that means nothing if the Word of God is not governing, governing those who are in them. And so we can literalize these things and have straps and phylacteries and, and scripture boxes on our doorposts like the Pharisees did. Or we can let God's Word rule over us. We can go to it and let it control us. Align ourselves with it and live by it. We can demonstrate again that we love the Lord with all of our hearts. When I love God, I'm going to fear Him. I'm going to be careful to observe His statutes. I'm going to place His words within my heart, teach them to my children, and beyond that, those around me. And I'm going to place them ever before. They're always going to be with me. And I'm going to be led by them. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Psalm 119, verse 11, and verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's going to be descriptive of you if you love the Lord with all your heart. So as we mentioned here in Matthew 22, Jesus has asked, What's the greatest commandment? I hope we have a greater appreciation of that. Of what the Lord has said regarding uh, the commands of God. When we love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our strength, we're going to be wholly devoted to Him. And so let us love God more. And let's fear Him more. And write His words on our heart so that He may govern all that we do. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, I believe in chapter 4, I think there's twice in that chapter where Paul is writing to the Thessalonian brethren about their love for each other. He says, now you have no need that I should write to you that you should love one another. You know. But he says, excel still more. Excel still more. And I think the fact that we're present here tonight is an indication that to some degree we love God. But excel still more. Grow in your love and devotion to the Lord so that we can Please him in all that way. If you've not put on Christ in baptism, if you've not become a child of God, then you're missing out on the blessings that are found in him and the hope of eternal life that we have in Christ Jesus. I would be glad to help you become his child right now, to become a, a, a Christian, to have your sins washed away, to be raised up in the newness of life so that you can begin that walk, that devoted walk to him. If you've not been living as you ought to, if you've not loved the Lord with all your heart, 
You can come back. We mentioned this morning in Luke chapter 15. God loves you specifically and he'll rejoice if you return home. And so the invitation has been extended to us by the gospel to draw us back to God so that we can enjoy the blessings that are found in Christ Jesus. If there's any way we can pray with you, we can encourage you or help you in any way to be who God would have you to be, I would be glad to do so. If there's any way you need to respond to our Lord's invitation, why not now as we stand and sing to